Hello and welcome to Who Wore It Better, where we review Raw and SmackDown back to back and try and figure out which show won for the week. And hey, did you hear that WrestleMania is going to be free for new network subscribers? That's the biggest takeaway I got this week. Raw begins with a face off between Kurt Angle, Ronda Rousey, Stephanie, and Triple H. The coach moderates this one. Stephanie comes out first, does a little dance on the stage. Before Triple H comes out, uh, when they're all in the ring, Ronda basically gets Stephanie to spill the beans and reveal their ulterior motives to bend Ronda to their authoritative will and such. Everyone takes a turn putting Ronda Rousey over. Stephanie, Triple H, Kurt Angle, everyone's talking about how great Ronda Rousey is. Uh, Stephanie don't, has the burn of the night when, she's, when she asks Ronda how well she handles losing. But then Ronda counters just by saying, I'm going to rip your arm out of the socket. That's the only thing she really has at this point in terms of promo. Pretty match photo op with the rest wrestling media. Okay, what media is going to be there? Is Bill after there taking pictures? No, he's not. So anyway, they're doing their, their pose down for the pictures. Triple H decks Kurt from behind with a microphone. He powders out of the ring. Stephanie picks up and slams Ronda through one of the tables, very reminiscent of what Ronda did Triple H at Elimination Chamber. So the authority stands tall over Ronda. Good to see some peril uh, on Ronda's in Ronda's way for a change. I thought it was a pretty strong opener. One thing that was funny was after their music is playing at the end, we go to this package about the Sami Zayn, Kevin and Owens, Dave O'Brien, Shane McMahon match on SmackDown, but you can still hear Bow Down to the King underneath all that. So you get all this different audio. You get the music bed for the package they're playing and the uh, dialogue, and then you hear Triple H's theme underneath. It was very hard to hear. First match of the night is Bailey versus Sonya Deville, and they have the physical women's battle royal trophy at ringside for this one. And after seeing it now in the flesh, you cannot tell me that the trophy does not look like the female reproductive organs. Uh, it is so blatantly looking like that. It had to be intentional. What a rib. Uh, anyway, early in the match, these two have kind of a scary collision when Bailey comes off the ropes to do like an arm drag move. But beyond that, I think it was a really strong match. I think it was easily Sonya's best match uh, on the main roster in a singles capacity since we're getting called up. And it was a very strong match for Bailey too, one of her better ones in recent weeks. Bailey wins, Absolution beat down afterwards. Sasha Banks makes the save and uh, helps Bailey. Sasha demands that Bailey raise her hand, which Bailey refuses, and they come to blows, and Absolution lays the two of them out. Uh, so again, it's like I think the, the biggest storyline happening right now in the women's battle royal is the conflict between Sasha and Bailey, which makes me think one of them is gonna win it. Uh, but yeah, so make all these other women that are there, what are they doing? Up next, Finn Balor takes on Seth Rollins in a rematch from a few weeks ago. Uh, Miz does commentary for this matchup, and wow, how crazy is it that, you know, just days after the birth of his daughter on Friday, he's back to work on Monday, live, on the road, doing this thing here. Honestly, if I were the Miz, I would have just asked, hey, can I do like a live via satellite, you know, promo shtick on the video, on the Titan Tron, after their match or something, instead of having to actually show up there, can I spend some more time with my kid? Uh, that's real dedication on the part of the Miz. It's gotta be tough to be away from your kid, like that soon after they're born, but you know, that's that's what they sign up for when they're when they're in the world of wrestling. I'm imagining after WrestleMania, he'll take some more time off to actually be with his family, but that's just my speculation. Uh, Miz is putting his newborn over a lot, too, on commentary as well. Uh, the match is great, by the way, between Seth and Finn. Like I said, it's very similar to what they had a couple weeks ago, but I think it, it built upon that. They recreated the finish from that first match, where it was the uh, superplex into a Falcon Arrow attempt, but Finn rolls through for a, for a pinfall attempt, but it's a false finish. Rollins gets distracted by looking at the the sign for a split second before making a frog splash. Oh, if he didn't look at the sign, he would have had enough time to hit the frog splash on Finn. Uh, Rollins teases the buckle bomb into the barricade, which is really cool. They teased that from SummerSlam a couple years ago, but that doesn't happen. Uh, and then after a bunch of counters and stuff, Seth finally hits the stomp on Finn and wins the match. Absolute belter of a match. I loved it. The Bar come out and say that no matter who Strowman will pick as his tag team partner, the Bar is going to win at WrestleMania because whoever Strowman picks, he and that partner will not be a real tag team. And now I'd like to remind you, the last time the Bar lost the tag titles, it was to a not real tag team. Strowman comes out and says he'll reveal his partner if one of them accepts a match with that partner tonight. The guys accept. Braun goes to the back saying, he's just like me, but a little different. Then he walks to the back and comes out as Brains Strowman, the twin brother of Braun with like a white shirt with the sleeves cut off and glasses. That's brilliant. It's so cheesy and so dumb, but I love it all the same. It's really great. Uh, the bar beat down Strowman, but he overpowers them. It's funny stuff, but like the, the, the question of who Strowman's partner is going to be still unanswered. I guess we're going to wait on Sunday to find out who's actually going to be with Strowman here.
Matt Hardy versus Goldust. It was what it was. Matt wins the twist of fate. I did enjoy Goldust's promo before the match where he quotes an Andre the Giant line from the Princess Bride to talk about the Andre Battle Royal. John Cena comes out and he gots to know what the Undertaker's status is for WrestleMania. He says he's still no answer from Taker. So he says, okay, I'm going to go to WrestleMania. I'm going to be a fan. And here I go plugging literally every match on the card and putting everyone over. And then he makes a very, very hard sell on the women's evolution by making clear success is not based on gender. Gee, someone fed him that line. Uh, Cena teases he's going to make a big change to his career soon. I thought that was an interesting line there in the middle of his promo. He gets the fans to scream to summon The Undertaker, but he still doesn't show. And uh, Cena says that Taker left his balls at home, shakes his head, drops the mic, and leaves. So now it looks like Cena is going to be spending at least a portion of the show, like, at ringside. I'm guessing then we'll get some... I mean, are we going to get any... Has this all been for nothing? Has all this build up to a Cena-Taker matchup all for absolutely nothing? Or is Taker going to show up in some capacity at WrestleMania? This is one of the things I'm most curious about. Because if Taker didn't answer on Raw to confirm a matchup, then what is Cena going to do? And how is The Undertaker going to tie into it? Up next, Elias takes on Heath Slater. The announcers spend more time talking about what Elias and Rhino are wearing. More than the actual match itself, Elias wins. Renee Young interviews Nia Jax about all the fat shaming that Alexa Bliss has done to her in recent weeks, including on this particular episode of Raw, and Nia says she doesn't care about all that. She loves herself and doesn't care who knows it. She's strong and she's powerful. I thought it was a really good promo for her. After that, we get Alexa Bliss and Mickie James taking on Asuka and... Dana Brooke? What an odd pairing this is that is apropos of nothing and just comes out of nowhere and will probably, probably never happen ever again. I can't even think of the last time Dana Brooke wrestled in a singles or a tag team match on television. I'm pretty sure that last time that happened, she lost to Asuka months ago, but uh, well, here we are anyway. Asuka gets the hot tag in and wins with the Asuka lock on Mickey. Bliss and Mickey beat down Asuka and Dana. Nia Jax runs down and grabs Alexa and the crowd pops for that that initial contact. Mickey does prevent Nia from beating up Alexa, but she gets destroyed in the process. So now we're going to have our, we're going to finally have, but you can see just by the fact that she grabbed Alexa Bliss, that initial contact, the crowd did go nuts for it. The fans do want to see Nia beat the hell out of Alexa. Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar come out to close the show. Now all night, Kurt Angle's been trying to keep Brock and Roman apart. Kurt's been begging Paul, please don't incite Roman Reigns. Don't say anything that's going to piss him off when you get out there tonight. And so then uh, the whole tag, whole, the whole Raw tag division, it seems, comes out onto the ramp to be a kind of a, a wall to protect Roman and Brock from each other. Then Heyman says in his promo that if Lesnar loses, it'll be the last time you see he and Heyman on Raw. Pretty sure it's not the first time he's made that promise in the past. Then he reveals Lesnar's true evil about how he doesn't care about WWE. Basically, you know, he's trying to confirm more of the fan bias about Lesnar. It's, again, this has been a night where villains reveal their true motives, like Stephanie did to start the show, and now Heyman and Lesnar do it here tonight. Uh, he runs, uh, Heyman runs down Reigns. He calls him Lesnar's bitch again. He Roman Reigns does come out, and the wrestlers are gonna, you know, stop him from coming out. Then Reigns is just like, "Come on, you're really gonna protect this guy." Come on! And then they think about it for a second, and they part the seas, and we get a Let's Go Roman chant. And then Roman comes in the ring, hits five straight Superman punches. Every time Lesnar gets up with a chair, and up, Superman punch. Knock you down. Uh, Roman holds the bells up and celebrates, but surprise F5. Uh, and so Lesnar stands tall again. I have to admit, I'm intrigued by this matchup. I mean, I think I know how it's going to go, but I think the build for it has been pretty strong. Like I said last week, that based on the last couple of weeks before that, like all those beatdowns on Reigns, boom, 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 when Roman finally does get the advantage in the build, hopefully the crowd will respond positively. And on Raw, they did. There was the chant, there was the initial pop when he laid out uh, Ray, uh, Lesnar with the multiple Superman punches. So so fans do want to see, uh, to some degree, want to see Roman beat Lesnar. Is that sample size indicative of the entire crowd of what's going to be at WrestleMania? No, but at least it's a good start. Before I move on to SmackDown, one final plug to any of you who are going to be in New Orleans this weekend for WrestleMania, because this Thursday night at the Joy Theater, Inside the Ropes presents An Evening with Paul Heyman, a one-of-a-kind speaking engagement with Brock Lesnar's advocate. He's going to be talking about his time in WCW, ECW, and both of his runs in WWE. Of course, there's going to be the exclusive meet and greets with the fans before and after the show. Who knows what he's going to say or what he's going to do, but based on his past experience with Inside the Ropes, no matter what he does, the wrestling world will be talking about it. Now, if you want tickets and information to this show, check out the link at the top of this description. 
SmackDown begins with Shane McMahon and Daniel Bryan opening the show. Daniel says that Shane was right about Kevin and Sammy all along in these past several months. The two of them both apologized for their actions toward each other. They hugged it out and they promised that Kevin and Sammy would pay at WrestleMania. And there you go. Uh, Shane is talking and walking around like he is currently battling an intestinal disease. He did not look or act like he was in 100% shape for this one honestly like how is he going to be good to go on sunday that's what i'm really curious about first match tonight is natalia versus charlotte in a rematch from two weeks ago when natalia stole a victory courtesy of a carmella distraction and speaking of which that's pretty much how the match ends this time around carmella comes out like she's going to cash in the briefcase but this time charlotte kicks the briefcase out of the ring uh carmella leaves the ring natalia tries to capitalize like she did before but it does not work this time charlotte puts on the figure eight to win the match and i get the need to remind people that Carmella is there and will most likely cash in at WrestleMania, but do we have to have a near exact replica of what we saw two weeks ago with just an inverted finish? You know, you make that argument about the Seth Finn match on Monday, because that is a very similar match to what they did before. Uh, the only argument I would have in defense of it was the men's match, in my opinion, was better. Then after the match, Asuka comes out, she gets on the microphone and says that the queen will bow down to the empress, and then before she can finish her catchphrase, Charlotte steals the microphone out of her hands and says, oh, I'm ready but are you ready? And that's pretty much it. They look at the sign for a second and then the music plays. It's the end of the segment. I feel the, I feel the build for this match has been kind of incomplete. Like, you know, they're for, they're limiting Asuka's mic time because of the language barriers. She's only been on the microphone one or two times. They aren't on the same shows most of the time, so you don't see that conflict much like you do with AJ and Shinsuke, for example. They are giving away an in-ring interaction on the Mixed Match Challenge the same night, which frankly, not everyone is going to see. So I think that's kind of wasted on that. I feel the match, I, you know, I like the match on paper. I just have not been digging the build to this one. Jinder Mahal takes on Rusev, and for what feels like the hundredth time this year alone, Bobby Roode joins the team on commentary. I wonder if he's just trying to like transition into doing commentary full time after his wrestling career dies down, because he's been on there a lot. They might as well put his name on the chair. Sunil Singh uh, tries to pull an Aiden English as he introduces Jinder. He sings a little bit, but then Aiden, I swear Aiden was channeling his inner rock when he was introducing Rusev, because he pulls the mic away and does this thing, like he's smelling the air as the fans go, Rusev day. I thought this was kind of funny. Uh, Rusev wins wins the match after deflecting a distraction by Sunil. He does the Mashka kick to Jinder to win the match. Crowds very much into Rusev and Rusev Day. But you know what? After the match, Rusev might as well have said, Randy, because RKO out of nowhere by Orton. Aiden English gets one too. Then they have a stare down between Orton and Bobby Roode. And that is how the segment goes. I guess we'll just see what happens at WrestleMania. We have an eight-man Battle Royal Reminder match as Brizongo, Ty Dillinger, and Zack Ryder take on Baron Corbin, Dolph Ziggler, Mojo Rowley, and Primo Cologne. I thought Dana Brooke pairing with Asuka was a weird thing, but here comes Primo Cologne. We haven't seen him or Epico in what feels like 100 years, and here he just shows up with the heels. Okie doke. People just start throwing each other out of the ring, Battle Royal style. Corbin just launches Breeze into a whole mess of guys on the floor, hits Fandango with the end of days to win the match, poses next to the trophy, and that's pretty much it. Primo Cologne? Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn storm the arena and stand on the announce table to cut a promo on Shane and Daniel. Zayn is dancing around like a goof, and I can't take him seriously, but yet I still love it. Uh, security is very lax here, considering that Kevin and Sami are technically still fired from the company, and they really shouldn't be there. Shane and Daniel Bryan come out afterward on the stage as the heels go up the stairs to say goodbye. Tell everyone to say goodbye to Sami and Kevin. Another match where the build, to me, has felt like just kind of wonky. I think it's just the last minute ness of it all. The fact that like Daniel was only approved to get back into the ring like two, three weeks ago, and we never really knew where this was gonna go with Shane and Daniel. Were they gonna fight each other? What well, yeah, how is it gonna work out? It just feels like it's one of those things where it's like been very backloaded and also in kind of a weird order where the physicality comes a few weeks ago and not like on the go home. Uh, yeah, not every build for WrestleMania needs to have that, but it just feels like it's one of those, it's, it's, it, to me, it just kind of ended on a weird, eh, kind of half-hearted note. Main event time is AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura take on Benjables. Earlier tonight, we saw some pre-recorded promos from AJ and Shinsuke about their match at WrestleMania. I thought Shinsuke's especially was pretty strong. Uh, Shinsuke's playing mind games with AJ. Like he, he pats him on the head to tag him out. Uh, AJ gets a lot of work in this match, so it seems that whatever injury 
injury scare was reported in the last couple of weeks seems to have been resolved, at least enough to the point where AJ can work and go at a decent level. He refuses to tag Shinsuke back in at the end and just looks at him, stares daggers at him, and then does a phenomenal forearm to Gable to win the match. And mirroring last week, Benjables beat down uh, Shinsuke afterwards, but then AJ gets in the ring, saves him, then he goes for a phenomenal forearm, but he pulls back, doesn't quite, doesn't, he doesn't hit him, then he pats him on the head, and so that's the whole, well, that's the way the show ends, and Shinsuke's like, what? How could that? He's surprised that he also got the pat on the head as well. I thought that was kind of funny, but I am enjoying the last few weeks of this build for AJ and Shinsuke, the opposite of how I feel about the Charlotte Oscar build, uh, which is similar in a lot of ways. I think that this one has done, I think, a much better job. I really am enjoying the build to this face versus face match. It's hard to really do a good face versus face build, and I think given what they have, I think they're making it work. Time now for me to decide which show won for the week, Raw or SmackDown. So which go-home show went home harder? After some thinking, I've decided that Raw had the stronger show this week, in my opinion. You know, both shows did very heavy pushing for WrestleMania, obviously. I think both shows had at least some storylines that progressed nicely this week. But I think that just as an overall package, Raw was the stronger show. Uh, it had uh, better matches, better promos, better storytelling. I, I love the opening face-off, uh, even as contrived as the photo op thing was. Uh, Bailey and Sonya was a great match. Seth and Finn, great match. Brains Strowman, as goofy as it was, I loved it. And the closing segment I thought was pretty strong too. And probably the best job they've done at making Roman look like an actual like conquering badass hero. With SmackDown, I thought the main event was the strongest match of the night. And I'm really enjoying the AJ Shinsuke build. So it did a good job moving that narrative. And you know, weird twitching, dancing Sami Zayn. Don't know what that was about. Don't know what he was going for, but it worked for me. I enjoyed it. And then there's again the copy and paste nature of the Charlotte Italian match with just everything was the same except for the finish and how it's oh we're flipping it this time 50-50 booking you know, and like I said you could argue the same thing about Seth and Finn on Raw but their match in my opinion was better well that's gonna do it for who wore it better this week folks let me know what show you thought was better in the comment section below and vote in the gimmick in the upper right hand corner of your screen tomorrow is the season finale of Wrestling with Regret with my review of the film WrestleManiac then all weekend long I'm gonna be in New Orleans soaking up the atmosphere of Wrestlemaniac WrestleMania weekend. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thursday night, I'm going to be in the crowd at the WrestleCon Super Show and at Wally Mania just up the road that same night. Uh, then I'm going to be boothing at WrestleCon all weekend at the Sheraton New Orleans on Canal Street. I'll be sharing my table with Colin from Kayfabe News. It's one of my favorite parts of Mania weekend the last few years, just getting to see all the sites and all the people and all the legends and meeting so many of my fans who come by and say hi. I really enjoy talking with you guys. And then, of course, WrestleMania on Sunday. I'll be in attendance for that as well and I'm going to be getting a lot of different video. I'm going to be covering a lot of different things about Wrestlemania weekend and that'll go on the channel in the weeks to come. So give this video a thumbs up if you like it. Comment below. Subscribe to Wrestling With Regret. Buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm happy. I'm psyched. I'm jazzed for Wrestlemania weekend. I can't wait. It's my favorite time of the year. I'm Brian Zane and I'll see you in New Orleans.